Well, g'day. How are you doing? I'm from Australia. My name is Chris. Um, I'm talking today about uh, something called uncanny nature, which is a, a thing called hybrid stop motion. Sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but um, I'll get into it. And so essentially, it's sort of the first half of the talk's about um, this project that I've been working on. And, um, excuse me, sorry. <coughs> and the second part is about Blender. Yeah, so it's sort of almost two thirds about non Blender stuff, but it'll all link together in the end. Just a sec. <coughs> all right, so, um, so this was an exhibition I had earlier this year, and all stop motion, pure stop motion, but also the armatures themselves. These are the, the physical things that I made for the exhibition. They were animated, they were projected, but the armatures were sculptures as such. And so there's a bunch of um, armatures and, and different bits and pieces. I'll, I'll go into that in a second, but essentially that was the sort of starting point of um, the blender phase and the end point of the previous phase. So I'll just give you a bit of a background to this previous sort of stop motion bit and then explain that bit. Um, so these were the works, and so I promised never to ever put video into PDFs or, or um, ever again, but I'll try it, okay? So forgive me if it just, but it should work. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. It says sound. Try this other one then. Or oh, is it going to be? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can we turn up sound at all? Or is there? No? I'll just see if it works outside, then I, I won't use the, the PDF. I swore I'd never do it again. Did it try to grab? Yep. Did it grab me on the bottom of the Choose. Yeah, save my devices. Oh, yeah. No, this one should, because I've got HDMI, so it should be HDMI, yeah? Uh, I'll just play a movie and see. No. What was your suggestion again? So. Yeah. Playback devices? Yeah. Now, uh, play the movie to see if it was one, which one is. Uh, yeah. How much is that window? There's this now, one. This oh, man. All right. <laughs> I didn't. I prepared for everything else but this. Uh, let's just disable that. The other ideas about this one? <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you later on why I had to use this computer, but um, yeah, we'll see. I'll just try for 30 seconds and then. Um, anyone else? Any experts that can do this? No? <laughs> oh, all right. So there we go. So cool. Oh, so it's only on this. <laughs> That's good enough. That'll be fine. Eh? Let's pick it out. All right, let's try it again, yeah? <laughs> All right, now. So. Um. of these things, creatures, constructions. It all makes sense in a second. Okay. So cool. So um, 
Here we go. All right. So I'll get, I'll get, that'll make sense in a second, but essentially this thing called hybrid stop motion. So really, I, I started out as a 3D person. I was a 3D animator for 20 years. And the, actually, the last time I was in Amsterdam, I lived here for a year, working at a place called Lost Boys Games. Yeah, anyone remember Lost Boys? A really cool game in about 2001, about 15 years ago. And so, um, and that was great. I was a 3D person for a long time. Then I just went into this stop motion stuff, uh, and I'll explain in a second why. And, um, but it was very constricting. I think like a 3D person, I think digitally, I think that way. Whereas stop motion is a physical thing, and you touch it, and that's it. You, you photograph it. It's a very, very primitive form, and it's beautiful because of that. But it's, it's, I felt very restricted. So this thing called hybrid stop motion, um, the most famous people are Leica. They're the proponents of it. And I don't know if you've seen Paranorman or the Box Trolls, even Coraline, they started using it. So essentially they have stop motion puppets on green screens. They then put it into an environment with the 3D characters as um, extras. So these are the lead animators who animate the master characters, and then the digital animators animate the background people. So it's sort of using visual effects, the best of visual effects and the best of stop motion, you know, to get that beautiful stop motion uh, motion or sound or movement. But we can have moving cameras, they have motion control systems, so moving cameras, 3D scene, etc. It's this thing called hybrid stop motion. And um, so has anyone been to Australia? Yeah. Cool. Did you go to Queensland? Yeah, did you go to Brisbane? Yeah. Fraser Island? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, all right, cool. So this is Australia. If you, if you don't know what Australia looks, looks like, that's it. This is the place we're talking about, which is right here. I come from Brisbane, and it's a little place just here, so in, in a state called Queensland. And so there's Noosa. If you had been on the backpacker trail, <coughs> Noosa is about 200 k's up here. Byron Bay is down here. And here's Brisbane. But here's this little tiny, weird little island. It used to be called Peel Island. And uh, now it's, it's um, been taken back by the traditional owners. Um, it's called Tokarua National Park now. And so it was actually a lazarette from 1905 to 1961, which essentially is a leper colony. Now, when I was a kid, I was terrified of leprosy. I, I watched um, uh, Papillon, didn't I see Papillon, the Steve McQueen movie, it was that leprosy and, and, and sharing cigars with, with lepers, and it was just weird. And there's um, the Ten Commandments, there's always lepers on the outside of, of, the, of the, um, uh, the cities. And so um, in Queensland, there was such hysteria around leprosy that they used to just pack you up in the middle of the night and send you to this little island, and you couldn't leave. You were stuck there forever. And um, it's only about three kilometers long. And so um, it, it was a, a notorious island. Not many people know about it, but they've heard these rumors about this weird little place. It's only about a kilometer off the coast. And so, um, yeah, so most people were sent there, and they just lived their days out there and then died. And so now it's just a, uh, just a national park. There's not much on there. Uh, and it's quite a beautiful island, but it's a, it's, a, it's a weird island. This is the thing, this uncanniness, which I want to talk about. And so, um, beautiful tropical island, beautiful long beaches, but the beaches, or m a large part of the beaches, have these weird upturned tree roots looking to the sky. So it's, it's a very odd looking thing. There's beauty, and then there's this weird stuff. And then there's the lazarette itself, which is a heritage, li heritage listed site. And so it, it held about 200, 300 people at one stage. And um, these are the little quarters that they had, little tiny huts. This was the superintendent's huts. And so I did a, a bunch of residencies with, with some other people, um, 2010, 2011. And we stayed in the huts. We stayed in the old uh, place. And there was an old graveyard around there, but there's no um, markers for the gravestones. So wherever you walked, it was just odd. It was a very odd little place. And uh, creepy. I'd, I'd say it was creepy. And so now this is what it looks like now. And so I think that was in 1949, I think, these photos were taken. And so half of the site now is collapsed and ruined and rotten and, and really dangerous. And the other half is brand new, freshly painted little holiday cabins. So it's odd. It looks like someone's taken all the tourists that are out and they're just about to come back at any moment. But no one comes back. It's just no one's allowed to go there. So it's just this site that is silent. Really, really strange. And so um, this is a thing called the uncanny. And so did anyone see the Polar Express? That's, that's the most... <laughs> If you want to know creepy, that's the creepiest movie I've ever seen, I think. Uh, and so essentially, the uncanny is this uncomfortableness where something is at once familiar and unfamiliar. So she, we know she's a human, we know she's uh, a girl, but she's not. She's a digital, weird character that doesn't quite meet up to our expectations. And so she's familiar, but yet she's unfamiliar. She's almost zombie like. Zombies are very uncanny. And so it's not as if they are familiar or unfamiliar, it's when they happen at the same time. They have to be both at the same time to be uncanny. So zombies are uncanny because they're supposed to be dead, but they're alive. They're not really alive, but they are alive, but they're not. 
So you, you, you never really, it's a tension. And so with um, the site, or the, the island as such, it's beautiful, but yet it's really creepy. It's really quite um, serene, and yet a, you're walking on a graveyard. So it's, there's all these tensions that coexist. And it's the same thing with a hybrid stop motion. It's sort of two things coexisting at the same time. Oh, I love that thing. And so when I was on the island, I, um, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. Um, but when I was on the island, I uh, went to the beach. Uh, we were staying in these huts, and about a, a two-kilometer walk to the beach. And um, on the way back, at night time, I, I went and had a look at the water. And coming back, the torch broke. The torch stopped working. So I had about a two-kilometer walk through forest with no one else around, and it was just black, just pitch black, inky, inky black. And I was really shit scared. I, I sort of thought, OK, I'll, I'll just follow the path through the, the, the forest. And when I looked down at the ground to try and trace my tracks, the forest was alive. I could see it moving. I could see things moving. And, and then when, when I looked up, there was nothing. There was just a branch or little shapes in the, in the darkness. When I looked down, I, I could see them moving. I, I swore they were there. It was only lasted about five minutes, but it was sensational. It was, the, it was the best experience I've had for ages. I was terrified, but I was really, uh, I wanted to see them. I really wanted to see these things. What did they look like? I wanted to focus on them. Um, I knew they weren't real, but th they, you know, they were. And so in that sense, the, my dream to the state had become reality. Conscious and unconscious worlds were both sort of coexisting as such. And so this was the, the, the moment this whole project has been about, essentially. Um, trying to sort of recapture that moment and um, trying to bring those creatures to life, whatever those creatures are, whatever they're called. And so, um, that's the uncanny. Uncanny also, there's a doppelganger, which is an evil twin or a, something that's, it's, it's a wrong thing. It's a bad luck, an evil twin, a harbinger, harbinger or bad luck or doom. Paranormal. And so I sort of started to sort of make some works about this place. Didn't really know how or why. And so we started doing bits of different tests and things, but it really early stop motion because I knew I had to do something real because it was a real place. It was a, a very physical place. And so we sort of made some little things, but then we joined a few together just by an accident and they became sort of uncanny as such. So this on its own is nothing. Just a little playing around with plasticine to sort of learn stop motion. But then when you make that, really weird, and it's, it's sort of creepy, I think, because we don't know what it is anymore. We knew it was plasticine, but all of a sudden it's become, I don't know what it's become, <laughs> not really sure, and it probably says a lot about my brain, uh, I guess, <laughs> I'm show this to people. Yeah, Chris, that's awesome, that's great, mate, that's really good. Um, mm -hmm. So, it's, it's good, it's, it's sort of rep uncanny repetition. Oops, sorry. And so, this is the main influence of, of the stop motion move as well, this guy Jan Spankmeyer, he's my favourite animator and he animates real things. And this idea that objects are more alive than people. So I, I started animating things at the lazarette, the old spoons and the old bottles and the old bits and pieces, but I thought the forest was the thing that observed the, the lazarette, the events, and the, the forest things is what I wanted to animate. But it's hard to animate a, a stick, it's really difficult. So for him, objects have things in them. And so this is an example of the, um, the sockets. So they're, they're metal sort of sockets. And the more we sort of got into stop motion, we realized that if I have a, a picture of this and I animated that picture, it, the pixels never change. They just, you move the pixels around, it's great. But every time I, I physically move that and animate it, there's a bit of my sweat and skin and dirt on that stick. The stick changes every single time. So it holds the memories of, of my interaction with it. It's a really quite a profound thing, but yet a very basic, sort of primitive thing. Um, so I love this. I coerce the inner life out of them. So I spent a long time fondling sticks and carrying sticks around and doing lots of things with sticks, um, which was cool. And so for the motion design, I didn't want to just do um, Disney. I didn't want trees to come to life and have a little sidekick character and they've got eyes and they talk to me. I didn't want that. I wanted it to be a bit more serious or, or creepy or something. And so I, I spent a long time look, thinking about, well, how would these things move if they moved? If they walked, what would they do? Or what is the motion? And so there's a... OK, this is going into more disturbing territory now. Um, this is a bird, which is funny, I think. <laughs> So he's insane. He has lost connection with reality. He does this over and over and over again. He's a distressed animal. 
uh, and he's, uh, he's broken. He's a broken, broken animal. And so I started animating these things. Um, and so this is the example. So here's another example. It's called stereotypic behavior. And every, almost every animal that is kept in a zoo demonstrates this behavior. They've been constrained and restricted for too long. And they do this motion. That's, that's all they do all day. And it's, um, it's really, really sad. And I thought that that's what the patients would be like. Because they were on this island, they couldn't leave, stuck with lepro... Lep well, they were stuck with lepers. Because if you went there and you didn't have leprosy, you were just suspected and you would just shunt it off. Um, if there was a certain type of leprosy, you would catch it while you were there. Then you could never leave. So it was this horrible, horrible place. And so this was the, the motion that I did on the... based on the horse. And this is where Blender first came into the, um, the scene. So I just did this, I, I started animating in Blender just a bit of box, you know, to get the, the motion right. Then I started sort of duplicating it as well. And the thing that I like is that there's lots of these mistakes in there. And so when I'm doing 3D, I wouldn't allow those mistakes in there. Like a, you know, like a million years, I wouldn't ever, ever allow them. There's a little bit chip in there. But with stop motion, it makes the glitch on it to do the whole thing again. Of, if that's a word, performativity, of, of that. It's, uh, it's hard, it's really difficult as a 3D person to give out control, to let mistakes happen, to, to allow them to exist, but there's something good about that. So that was the original works, and, um, and it was great. Exhibition, it was good, really creepy sort of stuff, to try to convey this sense of what this island was. I went back quite a few times to, to get more information about it, and I used to take other artists back and, and take them to the forest and we'd turn the torches off and try and look in the forest to try and see these creatures, but it never really worked again, obviously. And so um, two things that happened, this was in February this year, two things happened. I um, played with that Oculus uh, dev kit. We got one at the place I work at. And um, no, I, I found a lot of VR was quite average, just like a oh, sort of game stuff. But when you find one that has that, where it works, and you experience presence, where you believe that your body is in this environment, it's a profound experience. And I wasn't the same afterwards. Um, so I had a really positive VR experience. And I thought, well, if I wanted to communicate that island, that, how that island was, or how it um, felt to me, exhibition isn't the right space for that. It's a little bit too sort of clean and, and cube-like. Whereas VR would be the thing. I thought, well, cool. OK, let's just make it VR. I'd, I'd love to do that. But um, I tried modeling some of the sticks and these, these bits and pieces. Um, and even though that's, you know, that's a very simple object, it wouldn't take long, it just didn't really look right. It looked like a game object. It looked like a 3D object that I'd modelled. And so the second thing that occurred um, was I saw, I think, yeah, I saw this video. Did everyone see the, you know, the Kite uh, real-time short film at GDC? And so they did a really long presentation of their photogrammetry uh, 3D scanning process, and it just blew my mind away. So realistic, beautiful, high-risk trees. If you haven't seen the Kite short film, it's a quite a long short film. They made a kilometers of environment, beautiful photoreal environment. It's all real time. Um, and so they spent a long time of how to work out this process of getting these assets scanned, retopologizing them to make them into a game. Right. And, really, and I thought, well, that's, I'm not going to model these things. I am going to scan them. And so that started the next, basically, the six months of R&D, which I wanted to talk about at the end. Um, how to get those sticks to be into the Oculus, which is not quite there yet, well, how, and, and how to use Blender as the main tool for that. And so I'll just go over a few of those things. Once again, another, another of the reasons why I went to stop motion, uh, I worked with a, a guy called Max Banner. He was a very famous animator in, um, in Queensland uh, in the 70s and 80s, and he retired when I was uh, starting to work at this university. And um, he had a really huge old animation table from the 70s called a Forox. It's from Germany. And it weighed a ton. It was probably about um, 12 foot high, the, the rostrum camera. Really big stuff. Took four of us to lift it. Um, and so he's going to throw it away. It was a rusty old thing. And I grabbed this top part of it to use because I thought that could be automated or, or it could be interesting because it's a beautiful, beautiful thing, these old dials and counters. And so I took that apart and, and, and made it to be just a, a nice uh, sliding animation surface with, with wheels and little uh, counters, perfect for stop motion. And, and then I got an artist to do some stuff with it, and we sort of took it apart, and he added some uh, Arduino, or an Arduino, some stepper motors, some small little um, Arduino shields, 
And so we automated that in a very rough way. At the same time, we automated a little camera. So I used something called Dragon Frame, which can talk to the <coughs> Arduino and then talks to the motors. And I can set up little sort of system. So yeah, I'll show you that in a second. Um, so that was good. That was the start of this, this motion control idea. And it's almost there now. And he used a 3D printer, which I didn't quite understand at the time. And so we, we managed to get hold of a 3D printer for a little while. And so then we started to print out stuff. We, we printed out this, um, uh, the next version of the 3D motion control. And this is what I did as well. I made a little... So essentially with photogrammetry, you have something, an object that you want to scan. And you place a camera and you do a turntable. You, you take, say, 30 shots of that object from the bottom, and then you take it from the top, and you do 30 times around. So it's a very tedious thing to have to move that 30 times. And so in this way, I made a little motor with an Arduino, and it's a little turntable, and that hooks up to, uh, to the stop motion software. So it takes one, moves it, moves it, moves it. You can specify how many times and how fast it goes. So it sort of automates the process as such. And this was the best setup that I found for, because we have a camera looking down at the object, so we have to have a green screen underneath it. We also have to have the green screen over the top of it when we look up at the object. So that was quite nice. And this sort of simple sort of setup of these um, uh, soft boxes. So cool. So that was the start of it. But then, yeah, the big thing was this idea of scanning was okay, but the, the meshes that it produces is just, it looks like a solid color there, yeah? <laughs> it's just, yeah, one to two million polygons. And it's sensational resolution, but it's, you know, useless to work with. And so I never really knew how to do this. I thought, I'm not, I could have to do 40 to 50 to 60 sticks to, to scan these things. It would just take forever to do it by hand. But I purchased the re, uh, re flow add-on, uh, which was uh, awesome, uh, mostly awesome, <laughs> almost awesome, just about awesome. Uh, because they're simple cylinders, it, it wasn't really too hard. It's just that when you had the, the big gnarly sort of bits around here, that was um, quite difficult. But yeah, it, it um, worked very well. Um, one of the probably the main problem that I had initially was that when you scan something, it, ha it collects little bits and pieces of fragment from when it moves around, when it, when it takes a picture of each section of the object, and it just lays it out like that, which is terrible. And I didn't, I didn't even know what to look for online for the, the forums, how to solve this. Oh, I thought it was going to be like a Photoshop plugin action or something to sort of grab the islands and move them together. I just didn't quite understand it. But the, um, the solution was actually really quite simple. It was just, uh, once I'd done the low-res version, I just baked it. And then when you bake it, oh, so I, sorry, I had the high-res version, I made the retopologized version, and I unwrapped that. And then, yeah, once I baked the high-res to the low-res, it just joined them together and made these beautiful, well, there's a mistake there, but it yeah, made these beautiful um, uh, textures, so I just did it automatically. So I could use the incredibly high-res ones, get the texture itself, and get the normal, and, um, and go from there. So that was a, a really big moment. And so essentially the last six months has been about these little little chips away at getting this, this project, project happening, or project, um, I don't know about finished, but moving forward. So this was the armatures. So we spent a long time in the studio trying to sort of work out you know, how do these trees and sticks move and what do we do. And we used to make them out of wire as well to try and get these things sort of working. We didn't really know how or why. And then we found the ball and socket armatures, which were great. And then we covered the ball and socket armatures with bark and paper, etc., etc. We tried these different things. But um, anyway, yeah, we actually put sticks onto the armatures. We did try all these sort of different things. And so this was um, to rig this now in 3D was going to be a lot easier because we knew what the format was. We knew what it's going to look like, how it's going to work roughly. So this was the first 3D or the, the 3D sort of armature that uh, I made and, and put a material on which was great, but I, um, I couldn't quite finish the material. I made a, a, oh, I downloaded a, a rusty one and, and made a bit of a, um, a version for what I wanted. But I didn't know what the environment was going to be like in the end, so I couldn't quite finish the material. And I was sort of stuck once again. I didn't want to append this armature, or th these little bits and pieces, to all the files, and then have to update the material 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 times. Um, so I sort of wanted to use the library linking, but I had never used that in Blender before. And so I, I, I dove in and, and, and tried to learn it, because I wanted to be able to say, well, look, I, I need you to start to move forward and animate and put these things together. I don't have to wait to do the material for the socket. That's a very dull thing to do. Um, so yeah, the next thing was this library linking, which was just a disaster. Um, absolutely, absolutely terrible thing. 
So I, I come from Maya. I used to use Maya. I moved across about 80 months ago to Blender. And um, so Maya has a thing called the, the structure, the project structure. You make a project, it gives you a bunch of folders, and um, you work within that project. So at the beginning of your um, session, you say, set your project to wherever this folder is, and it's a portable, transportable idea. Whereas the Blender one is, is similar, but if you move the project to somewhere that it's not supposed to be, it loses the links, and that's it. You can't update them again. It's just lost. I mean, I, if someone knows how to use it, I'll, I'll chat to you later, but I had a great deal of problem. And in the end, it was all about this relative uh, linking, relative paths, obviously. But even that would get lost sometimes. So I had to use this computer today, and I had other ones to show you, but they're on another hard drive, so I couldn't use them because once I copied them, I couldn't. The, the links would be disappeared. It's a very odd system. So it works at the moment, but it's held together with stick tapes and band aids. So it's terrifying at the moment. Just just working, just barely working. But you know, it, it's it's good. But um, yeah, it's scary. So yeah, so we made the sockets. We made the library linking thing, which was good, it was enough. And then we did the rig, and I'll, I'll load up the rig to show you. And this was actually really successful. This was one of the quickest things, ironically. I thought the rigging would just take forever, and it would be really difficult. But um, it, was, it was great. It was very, very simple. Uh, or simple-ish. Um, so yes, that's it. So there's the um, that stick. Another solution, I'll talk about it in a second, is to just make real soft boxes. I found a thing called Light Objects Online. I think it was for another program. Uh, it was like FBX or something. But um, So essentially, it's a soft box with a HDR image on it to give the material. Uh, so it's just a, a really nice solution for the lighting. So yeah, so there's the object. This actually is the one. Um, yeah, so that stick has been Essentially, when I animated this, I was going to cover the screen there, but that doesn't work, does it? Um, to cover the half of it. So I did half of it. It was actually laying on the ground, and then I flipped it with this thing called bilateral symmetry to give it this extra-ness. On its own, it wasn't that interesting, but yeah, using that repetition, it became a creature. It became this wasp, um, I don't know, some sort of thing. There's a face, there's eyes or something in there. So I scanned this stick, these three sticks, this example, and here they are. So here is the... Um, So it's really quite nice, nice res now. And um, so therefore I attach the top ones, which is simple like cage chain, so I can move these guys. Also I attach this part of the chain, the top part of the chain to this object, and then I can move that object around as well. So it's just really, really nice to move, to pose around, etc. So I can move that there, move these around, they'll catch up eventually, etc. So yeah, that was... Um, Simple and successful. And so uh, in the other example, I um, attached them at both ends. So I could have at the top to be moving, at the bottom to be moving, and then I can move the other stick around. So quite easy to pose. Um, and this was it. So in the end, I, I sort of used a, a HDR, a simple single HDR with just one sort of studio light, which was okay, but it was, very, it was quite annoying to have to rotate the environment around. It was, wasn't very controllable. So this was the solution for me. To, if I'm going to replicate the studio lighting system, I'll just actually use the objects that were in the studio. It was very nice. And so this is a very nice kit. It was free um, fluorescence, um, umbrellas, soft boxes, etc. It's very, very, very nice. Um, oh, I was going to show you something else. Has anyone used the SIVL system in Blender? It's a really, really nice system. I'm not sure if it's installed in this one. Uh, it's a really simple sort of system for using... Um, Using HDRs. It should oh, one second, I don't know if it's going to be. So yeah, so we download these sets. Um, if we wanted to say use uh, this one, uh, I can't think it's going to. So let's say this one. Send the software, and I think. Now in Blender, um, oh good. <laughs> uh, uh, hang on, maybe if I oh yeah, of course, of course, that's great. Uh, excellent. So there we go. 
So therefore now we've got that beautiful HDR system. Uh, they're all free to download, it's a free system. Free to say, oh, I'd like this one, I found a new beach scene, send to the software, and it'll update Blender to be this scene now. Just beautiful. And we have full control over um, all the settings within this as well. The strengths, etc. That was a nice thing, but it, it was sort of difficult. I, that's nice for a daytime scene or an outdoor scene or, or a typical HDR scene, but... Uh, oh, yeah. So I'll sort of wrap up, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's a, that was a very nice system. And so at the current state of the project, we're doing depth of field tests, which has been <coughs> really great. We used to do them in After Effects, but that was a little bit limited with using just 2D images. We didn't have any depth in the objects. So that's been very good. We're doing tests with the motion, finally getting to the motion. We've just started motion. Uh, but these are the scans and the, and the sockets, etc. And so now we've got this hybrid thing happening where I made this thing physically, I've got the sticks. I've also scanned all the sticks. So now I've put that object into 3D and I can pose it and light it and play around with it and do different things with it. But then, and, and play with that and then go back to the real one and change that one around perhaps. So I can sort of work in between those two things because it's really nice to grab something and move it. But it's, yeah, both, both systems have their awkwardness. And so I think that's it. So essentially in February, there's the next exhibition of, of this uncanny nature. And so we'll have the first Oculus demo ready for them <coughs> uh, with projections, with armatures, and then a short film as well around that. Um, yeah, and so therefore, and I work at a place called Queensland University of Technology, and we're doing an open source pipeline. We've changed to Blender. We've, we went away from Autodesk. We've changed to Blender 18 months ago, and it's been sensational. Uh, really, really positive thing so far. Really enthusiastic, uh, which is cool. So yeah, any uh, VR people around who are into art-based projects, please uh, talk to me. I'd love to chat with anyone who wants to um, yeah, get involved with that stuff. Uh, so thank you.